The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. In the diplomatic spat between India and Canada, a rising India shows Canada that money is power, says John Rapley, a political economist at the University of Cambridge and the managing director of Seaford Macro. He goes on to say Canada is finding the world a hard place. Rapley points out it comes as a shock to Canada, namely because of its sense of itself. Canada has historically been dominant, one of the world's biggest economies, a founding member of the world's most powerful military alliance, a rich country whose aid programs gave it considerable leverage over developing countries. But, as Ottawa squares off with New Delhi over the recent alleged assassination of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil, it is being left largely to fight its own battle. In other words, Canada has stranded itself diplomatically at a time when the US and UK have been building stronger relations with India in an effort to safeguard against rising tensions with China. It gets worse, Rapley says, not only does Canada now occupy a less significant geopolitical space, but the country is a notorious shirker as an ally. With a recently leaked Pentagon paper revealing that Canada's NATO partners no longer consider it a serious member of the alliance. I invited John Rapley to join me for a conversation that matters about Canada's shrinking reputation internationally. John, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Welcome, John. Are we overstating or not being quite honest enough with what's happening to Canada's reputation as a serious player internationally? I don't think it's overstating. I think it's possible in the past we overstated Canada's importance. Canadians like to see themselves as a significant player. Um, and I think it was never as significant as we wanted to think. However, I think to say that the recent statements we've heard would be exaggeration is probably not correct. I think that it's more related recognition that Canada has sort of had a very easy ride in the 20th century. It was able to piggyback on the center of global power, the United States. Uh, the United States remains a center of global power, but it is less central to world affairs than it was 50 or 60 years ago. And Canada is less central to America's concerns than it was 50 or 60 years ago. And it's suddenly finding itself kind of having to find its own way in the world, feeling very lonely and not having any obvious friends or any anybody that owes it a debt of any sort that it, it can call in to try and reassert its influence. And so it finds itself being rather marginalized and in this dispute with India, kind of left to fight its own battle. The consequences of this fighting, this, this battle with India, on the surface, uh, at the moment, you would say, well, Canada is still a larger economy, but for how much longer remains to be seen. Or what, what we have done or doing in this spat right now with India, um, are we going to be able to move beyond it? Or is that even possible at this point? I think, Stuart, this, I mean, this diplomatic spat is going to, if I had to predict, I'd say it's going to be worked out. Um, you know, I think relations to India and Canada matter too much to each party for them to allow this to actually derail that relationship. And the other thing is Canada needs India. But the problem is, I think Canada needs India more than India needs Canada. And that is going to be the real struggle it faces. I think it's going to be a rather, it probably already is a humbling experience for Canada. It will probably have to give more and get less than it would have hoped going into this conflict. And uh, that's not going to leave Canadians particularly happy. It might even feel like India is getting its way a bit on this issue. But that is a sort of augury of what's to come in the future, I think. How important is India moving forward in the context of an Indo-Pacific trading region? Because we see India's population already just recently surpassing that of China and their economy continues to grow and is potentially uh, you know, going to continue to move forward in, in, in a very strong and vibrant direction. Uh, how important is it going to be or is it going to be vitally important 
Uh, One would assume so. It's still, the, there's a great deal of debate among economists as to what to expect of India's future. It is uh, more dynamic than China at the moment, but it's still much smaller economy, both in aggregate terms and more importantly, perhaps in per capita terms. And India has its own problems. The economic growth that has occurred there in recent years, which has been pretty impressive, has been highly concentrated at the top. You know, So the middle and upper class has done well, but the population as a whole hasn't really caught up in the way the Chinese working class has caught up substantially to its, you know, to, to working classes in the rest of the world. So there are those who say, look, you know, this is a bit of an illusion. India is not going to continue growing like this forever. But there is another school of thought that says, you know, the fundamentally the wind is in India's sails. Moreover, more and more countries are going to be looking to shift production, reorient production away from China towards India. Although I think the really significant growth that we're going to see in the future will be in services that India will be exporting a lot of services. But the big difference between India and China for the future is that China is a, a trading nation on a huge scale. India is much less of a trading nation and doesn't seek to make itself. It doesn't seek to rival China in that respect as a trading nation. That means it's not as eager as prospective trading partners are to reach trade agreements. The Indians are notoriously hard bargainers around the trade negotiating table. And countries like Britain and Canada, which are trying to secure some kind of free trade agreements with them, uh, find that they drive a very hard bargain because they're more anxious to get access to this rapidly growing market uh, than the Indians are to gain access to ours. Typically, if you look at the negotiations going on between Britain and India over trade, the main thing the Indians want to get is greater access uh, for workers, Indian workers who, particularly in the tech sector, have skills, perhaps been educated in universities in Britain. Uh, they would like them to be able to stay and work there because then they can sort of forge these um, global partnerships, working with firms back in India, which has been a tremendously successful model for them in Silicon Valley, for example. And when it comes to, to that, I mean, Canada has to ask itself, well, how attractive is it at the moment as a destination? I mean, there's a very large Indian diaspora in Canada, as we know. Uh, there's a very large Indian diaspora all over the world. But uh, the question really is, what do we have to offer them? And if you look in terms of trade, and, you know, this is a bit of the sort of the easy ride I've suggested Canada's had in the past, and it didn't sort of take advantage of that particular um, favorable time to make as much progress as it needs to face the 21st century. I've suggested that it sort of looks, has the profile in its trade of very much a 20th century economy. It's a resource exporting economy. And, you know, I sometimes would lecture my students in development studies and say that Canada is really best understood as a rich third world country. It exports a lot of primary goods, imports a lot of finished goods. And in the profile of its trade with India, that is exactly what happens. It flips the usual pattern you'd expect the developed countries exporting manufactured goods and the developing country is exporting primary goods. But in fact, we're importing things like pharmaceuticals. We're selling stuff the usual suspects. You know, we're selling energy, we're selling oil, and natural gas. And that is going to serve us well enough here in Canada for the next 15 or 20 years, but it's not going to, that won't last forever because the world economy is changing. It is decarbonizing. India itself will ultimately decarbonize. And if we're going to expect to be able to just live off our resources forever, it's, we're in for a bit of a rude awakening. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. I think we are in for a rude awakening because at the same time as you're talking about the products that we're selling to India, we are in a way uh, handicapping or capping any potential growth in the sectors that we have that we sell to them. So are we adding complications to this relationship, not just with India, but with other countries that are, uh, well, maybe starting to isolate us as well? Uh, do you mean in terms of, uh, are we complicating things in terms of our economic policy? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think the example I used recently in an article I published in, um, in a Canadian newspaper was 
if you take a country like Norway, which like country like Canada uh, is even more dependent on oil and natural gas exports than Canada. But if you look at Norway, what have they done with that? What well, they've built the world's biggest sovereign wealth fund uh, that they're using to invest in companies around the world. But they're also using it uh, to decarbonize their own economy. And they're not saying, well, we have oil, so why would we bother? Which sadly has been the Canadian approach. Well, we have cheap energy. There's no need for us to decarbonize. So even though there's talk of decarbonization, uh, as we know in Canada, it runs into all sorts of objections. And this, for example, is going to become a problem in the future, because even though one can make a case for sticking with the cheap energy of oil and natural gas for the foreseeable future, it is looking increasingly apparent that a lot of the our major trading partners are going to not only continue along the route of decarbonization, but are going to be then imposing border taxes, you know, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, as the Europeans call it. And that is going to mean that any goods or even for that matter, services we're trying to produce using carbon intensive energy will be taxed um, and therefore that will make it less competitive on global markets. So there's been a high degree of complacency in that respect, rather than really saying, well, what is it we need to do to position ourselves for the future? Um, and I think this goes, I have to say, for the university sector as well. If you if you look at Canadian investment in higher education, I mean, or the, the educational system generally, Canada does very well in its primary and secondary public education. It really is a world leader. But when they get to university, it, you know, if you look at the amount of money that goes into Canadian universities, and then you look at standard measures like research output, international citations, the number of major international prizes they win, the number of patents that are registered in Canada as a result of research that goes on at Canadian institutes of higher education, the country is punching, I would suggest, well below its weight. And it really has to ask, why is it doing that? Uh, if you look at the... and there are many problems with the metric of global rankings, but nevertheless, if you look at the global rankings of uh, the world's universities, um, you know, a country like Britain, which per capita isn't really outspending Canada uh, in higher education, but the number of universities it has in the top 100 of the world far, far outweighs what Canada is contributing. And other countries are coming up that scale very rapidly. Chinese universities are coming up, Korean universities. Canadian universities aren't really budging much in the rankings, and it doesn't seem to be a top priority. That's going to be a real problem, because uh, if Canada doesn't find a way to shift towards knowledge and skill-intensive production, it is going to fall further and further behind. And as I say, then when it comes into these kinds of international relations, when it really comes down to, well, what can we offer you and what do you offer us? We're going to find we're offering less and less sets of value over time. And we're going to find ourselves in this increasingly weak position. Yes. And so the OECD points to Canada and says, for the next 10 to 40 years, Canadians are going to see a real per capita GDP decline for the very reasons that you pointed out. We are not investing in education and other infrastructure, and that's going to ensure that uh, not only are our education systems, but everything else that we do is going to be meeting the standards that we need going forward. Like, they're going to max out, and it's going to prevent us from being as competitive as we can. How do you think we got to this point in Canada? Um, I think, Stuart, I think I suspect that some of it came down to just an assumption that the good days would last forever. We got so used to having it easy. Um, we always figured, well, people want our oil, they want our potash, they want our forestry products. Occasionally we have a spat over it, but fundamentally uh, they want what we have. And, and there, we haven't really been challenged. If you look at the countries that have become being among the most dynamic world economies, I mean, I mentioned Korea a moment ago. Korea has almost nothing in the way of natural resources. And that argument has been made that it had no choice but to develop productivity of its human resources because it simply didn't have anything else to fall back on. Um, in Canada, we have had a lot to fall back on, but my suggestion is we're not going to have that to fall back on forever. In more recent years, I think we made some we made some huge mistakes, and this crosses the political divide. It's you know both at the federal level, both conservative and liberal governments missed a massive opportunity. I think after the financial crisis, for more than a decade, um, credit was very inexpensive. Uh, 
and the economy was growing sufficiently, but the priority was, well, among the conservatives, it was on tax cuts and among the liberals, it was spending. But what there wasn't was major infrastructure spending. Instead, what you had is you had this very cheap credit was essentially used to fuel a housing bubble. Housing ads, as I say over and over and over again, every time I write about the subject or speak in public on it, housing adds nothing to the economy, especially if what you're doing is buying existing property. You haven't even hired the workers to build it. You know, you paid an estate agent a little bit of money to sell it or to buy it. But the house itself adds nothing. It's not like investing in a factory. It's certainly not like investing in a train. I mean, Canada now is the only developed market economy that doesn't have high speed rail. Uh, it's public transit systems are pretty antiquated in most cases. The number of cities with a population of over 250,000, which don't have any kind of rail transit system in place. I mean, this people keep falling back on, well, but we all have cars, so why do we need to worry about that? But that's exactly the kind of thinking I'm suggesting is a problem. That cities built for cars are, are fairly well known, you know, not to be conducive to high labor productivity for a variety of reasons. And they're also not very good um, for resource allocation, again, for a variety of reasons. But we stick with the same model because it works. And you can hear politicians say it, well, we don't want to spend money on this because most people won't use it. So therefore, it's not justifiable. So rather than, rather than thinking, well, if we built some kind of infrastructure, whether it's better airports, rail lines, um, or whatever the case is, uh, high speed internet, um, low cost telecommunications. Um, let's not worry about what the existing demand is and whether it justifies it. What could that do in 20 or 30 years time to change the economy? There's very little of that thinking. Politicians get elected on saying, well, I'll cut the taxes and um, I'll keep your, you know, your fuel bills low. And that lack of really forward looking thinking, I think has been, um, has been really egregious in Canada. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So when our allies and trading partners, not just in North America but Europe, look at us right now, take all this into consideration, especially out of Europe right now, what's the perception of Canada? Well, I think the perception among Canada's, <laughs> how would I say this? I mean. The perception of Canada and the world is fairly benign, but not because people think of Canada as necessarily being this beacon of any sort in the world. It's sort of like it's harmless. You know, the, the very thing Canadians don't label, they don't like having attached to themselves. You know, in the Simpsons episode where the Simpsons family ends up in somewhere in Canada, I think it's in Toronto, and Marge Simpson says, it's everything I like, clean and boring. Um, that is very much the perception of Canada and the world. But I would suggest what it isn't is you wouldn't sort of encounter, let's say, many German high school graduates who would say, you know, I really want to go do my uh, university degree in Canada because they have the best schools in X, Y, or Z. They're, they will say that about the US. They will say that about Britain. Um, and now they're starting to think of other countries. That would be an example where, in principle, we really should be thinking about building leading institutions. But in practice, we haven't really been doing it, in my opinion. Um, and I think, therefore, that the image of Canada as being pretty harmless, pretty innocuous, doesn't really strengthen its... At, at the negotiating table because it's a country you don't really take seriously. It's sort of, well, okay, what do you bring to the table in a way that other, and it's not, and some would say, well, it's inevitable because Canada is just a middle power. It can't actually have outsized influence. But in fact, if you look at even just at the moment in the Middle East, what, what's going on in the Middle East, we hear more in the world's media about the positions of the Norwegian and Irish governments, for example, we hear almost, we hear almost nothing about what Canada has to say on this. Um, and that why that is, I don't know, but I mean, there's no particular reason why Norway or Ireland should be getting attention you know, from the world's journalists that a country like Canada isn't. I mean, it is a choice not to, almost as if our 
the national character of, you know, don't draw too much attention to yourself is the way we conduct our policy in the world. How do we turn this around? How do we move forward? And the point that I want to go back to is, you know, you talked about South Korea, uh, recognizing that its most natural resource or most important natural resource is the collective brain power and talent of its people. Do we need to start to encourage that and say that we're going to be making changes similar to which, let's say, Ireland did a number of years ago when it said, okay, we're going to be a major center of pharmaceutical production. We're not doing that in Canada. And as you pointed out, we import our pharmaceuticals from India. Can we turn this around? It, I'm sure we can, Stuart. Um, I'm sure we can. But how to do it and whether it will be done is another question. I do think at the end of the day, it comes down to strong leadership. You need a leadership that is visionary, that isn't trying to govern just for the existing. It isn't doing a slice and dice of the electorate and saying, well, this is where the votes are. This group wants that. That group wants that. I'll sort of give a little bit to this and a little bit to that based on what their existing preferences are, rather than going to the electorate and saying, this is what I can do for your children and for your grandchildren, so that by the time they become voters, they will have something meaningful to invest in. I mean, there have been some rather alarming recent surveys among young people in Canada, which shows that the number of young people who are considering emigrating from Canada has gone up quite sharply in recent years. Equally, the number of immigrants to Canada who take Canadian citizenship when they become eligible has gone down. It's almost like it's become a less attractive place. And I think it, it wouldn't just be, I think, a matter of, I think, I think part of what should be done, I think, within the university system. I mean, that's something, you know, I happen to know about having worked at in universities in Canada, as well as where I'm now based in Britain, um, but also in Germany and France and Africa. And, you know, I've, I've worked in universities around the world. And I have observed that, that that kind of complacency does reach into the Canadian university system. And I have, you know, I have theories for that, but I think um, there's that. And I, I do think it's, it's, I, th I would say that um, Canada isn't necessarily a country which values entrepreneurship as highly as it perhaps should um, and innovation uh, doing things, the sticking with, the existing path, sticking with what's known to work and what's safe, uh, I think is almost a sort of national characteristic. And the idea of rewarding someone who takes risks and not penalizing them for the failures that result from those risks. From, because, I mean, you can't innovate if you're not going to take chances. But if you look, and this is not peculiar to Canada, but I mean, banks will happily lend somebody money to buy a house because they have security. They're they're far more demanding of somebody who's trying to use it to expand a business. But as I say, the house will produce nothing. The business will. We have to look at, that's one thing, that, you know, where we could start saying, well, what are the things we don't, there's not much in the way of a venture capital industry in Canada. Why not? Uh, what can be done to change that? Why is it that speculative capital looks elsewhere rather than looking in Canada? What can we do to make it a more attractive place and to incentivize the creation of these kind of venture funds? The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. You remind me of a conversation that I had with someone who headed up a bank here in Western Canada a few years ago and I said, so why is it that you're willing to lend money to somebody who works for me to buy a house, but you run me over the coals and then don't lend me the money that I need when I'm the person who's employing him? And, and there was a bit of a shock from this person. And anyways, yeah. he quickly got his thoughts together yeah. and he said, yeah. well, it's because you're a higher risk. <sighs> okay, are we so adverse yeah. to uh, yeah. risk that we just sit in what we believe is neutral? But there is no neutral. You know, you atrophy when you're not moving forward. Yeah, and there are things that, that can be done within the regulatory system, for example. You can, I mean, banks are... are certainly incentivized to lend to safe investments of the sort you just mentioned. And you, I mean, you wouldn't want to go as far as the Americans did, you know, pre 2008, when they lift off all the controls, there's a lot to be said for the Canadian approach to banking, it means you avoid 
well, in theory, you avoid crises of the sort that were terribly destructive in the United States 15 years ago. But I guess you have to sort of look at that risk reward profile and say, is this a country that somebody looking to set up a business is going to find an attractive option? And the evidence would suggest it isn't because an awful lot of Canadians who want to set up businesses very often end up going to the United States or elsewhere to do it because they don't find this as a particular encouraging and supportive place to do it. And I think there's a cultural bias against it. If, you know, somebody who is graduates from university and sets up some kind of business would probably can be considered to be of inferior status to somebody who gets a job with pension and benefits, you know, because they can point to, well, this is what I have. And the other person is saying, well, this is what I hope to have one day. But we seem to value security highly. We seem to value comfort. We were talking about before the program, the Canadian love of comfort. And we seem to like what's comfortable and not going to sort of entail risk. Well, that seems to be the theme that has come up. It's leading to our international reputation shrinking. It's putting pressure on us domestically. This level of comfort and complacency, sadly, uh, maybe it has to get tougher before we wake up and start to respond to these challenges. Well, I think it is getting tough. I mean, uh, you mentioned this OECD study, but if you actually look at per capita income in Canada in the last couple of years, it has become declining already. Many people don't feel this because they're sheltered from it, but this is looking like it will continue equally. If you take debt out of the equation, Canada's economy has effectively been contracting for the last few years. The, can, the country has sort of reached a plateau and it either changes the way it does things and what it has relied on and been able to rely upon and it is a potential great strength of the country which is its openness to immigration uh, a country that can receive and absorb as many immigrants as canada has done throughout its history is a country that potentially will always have a future but lately again as with everything else we're not really seizing the opportunity that immigrants bring. We, we, we're really less looking at them as a supplemental source of labor. And that is what is essentially keeping the economy going is we just bring in workers from abroad. We're not necessarily using their skills at all well. You get doctors and surgeons who are driving taxis because they're not able to get the qualifications they need. And, you know, the, the list of uh, obstacles goes on. But I think that um, we are going to have to, we can't continue with this model. We're already seeing the kind of tensions that this is beginning to um, provoke in Canadian politics. And um, because I think what is happening is that people are starting to feel the economic pinch. Um, if I had to say, well, what is one very painful thing that Canada could do uh, to start changing the way it does things, I would say if the housing market were to decline and decline a lot and sustainably that would hurt a lot of people but it would be good for the economy um are canadians prepared to to sort of swallow that pill i don't know i don't know either but i'm encouraged that these discussions are now taking place with greater frequency and it uh, raises a sense of urgency amongst average people and, you know, maybe we might see that the, the bend in the road that is up ahead of us that we need to take so that we change the trajectory that we're on. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been a pleasure.